do. Good everything. Good everything, Nubians and others. Hello there. Good morning to you, Dr. Carr. Hi. Good morning to you, Prof. 191 and counting. Here we go. Oh, no, I think we're at 190. Are we at 191 or 192? 192, 192. Yeah, I'm tripping. 192. We, we right. ran it. There we go. We, Wow. This has been quite a run. You have been on fire. And I thank you for everybody with ears listening. <laughs> I'm serious. No, I, it's so funny. I was talking to the uh, 16th president of Howard University last week, Sidney Rabo, my friend Sidney Rabo. He came by. He wanted to see how the Grima City was. Well, we went by there and sat with him. And he says, I get my car, I turn on Sirius. And it's like a whole nother universe. And I said, yeah, I will pass that on to my friend. Well, <laughs> because, I mean, it's like you are, you've been on fire, especially these last three weeks. What I was saying to you off mic is that um, it's a strange mm -hmm. thing when people come together. Mm -hmm. you know, like most of us working, our, I, work, I work on my silo. I got my head down. I'm working. You're doing your thing. We all, you know, but when we lift our heads up and realize the common goals and we come together and f form like Voltron, Ooh. it's, 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 first of all, it's very refreshing. It's very refreshing to see so many like minds, but it's also, it's almost like we gave people permission to say the things and do the things because it's like now the power of the people is, it's like we're, we're powered by people who are fi like, finally, yes. Okay. Are, are we doing this? Okay. Are we doing this? Let's go. Let's go. It's so beautiful. Let's go. Yeah, and so as long as you've got the ingredients, that's that's one of people love quoting Malcolm, but they often quote him out of context. They love that. I tweeted some out this, this week about these next two sisters uh, in the South that the Biden Harris administration put on the bench, the federal bench. And I said, you know, the only way you think these two parties are the same and put no shout out to our brother Mike Harriet for making that point again, as he did uh, in the grill yesterday. But these parties are not the same. But uh, you know, people accuse, you know, me, you, everybody being shields of the Democratic Party. Of course, that's silly minded. I said, the only way you could think these two parties are the same is if you've never read any case law, you don't understand how the federal courts work, or you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, run them up, led astray. And people accuse me of misquoting Malcolm X, at which point, you know, I directed them to the, uh, to the uh, court case that he was involved in uh, when he was called to testify on behalf of the uh, Muslims, the black Muslims who were in prison and were not being allowed to exercise their faith in the full range. And he called on the first and 14th amendments in the testimony because everybody knows Malcolm wanted to be a lawyer when he's young. But anyway, quoting people out of context is just not going to, to, to do it. So, I mean, but but, what's, what's context when it's been shaped for you, right? So right. Feel, right. most of us, you know, we're, we're operating from, I even tell this to my students and I, you know, I feel bad. I said, you know, for most of your school life, you have been told what to regurgitate and then rewarded for regurgitating it exactly the way it was told to you. Yeah. It's not your fault that you, you know, aren't critically thinking and that you, you know, can't, you know, question because the question and challenge as a little kid um, puts you in the corner somewhere, right? It puts you at, at odds with the education system. So, so if you've been conditioned to regurgitate things that you were told that were truth and then rewarded with a gold star or an A, how do you undo that? Right. So we, there's a lot of work uh, that that we're doing every Saturday. And I thank you for having the knowledge because none of this could happen if you ain't read all them 50,000 books. So I appreciate <laughs> We all read. We all stay. <laughs> thank I you. you. I, hey, listen, yeah. it's the new normal, the, the renewed normal. We coming back. I, I'll tell you, though, that conversation you were having with Tamika Mallory, our sister Tamika, the other day, um, you said something. I mean, in the course of y'all's conversation, when you said that uh, everybody lives someplace. And I thought about that, I lingered on that because, you know, as she was talking about until freedom and you asked her to walk through what that is and how she said we kept it tight. Now, everybody wants. And I thought about Nubia and narrative and, and, and very similarly in the sense that tight and then people want, you know, I mean, you know, you've you've, you've created a space seven days a week at this point where. We're all in here and we're not afraid of facing ourselves. Our, we know we're vulnerable. There's no off topic conversation. I mean, I thought the conversation you had with uh, Brother Keith Ellison was incredibly important. You know, I don't know why, um, you know, we have people 
who would come against people's common humanity. I, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't understand. I mean, I say I do understand, but, you know, I mean, I'd love for you, for example, to talk to our sister, former educator, high school principal, I mean, uh, elementary school principal and teacher uh, who wears her cowboy hats in honors of one of her elders who was her jagna. I'd, I'd love to know why Frederica Wilson voted against Rashida Tlaib. But I mean, but I, but I, I, I know why, but I mean, I mean, but the point is that- <laughs> Because we reached out, I was scratching my head. I'm like, sis, no, really? no, I mean, you know, when, when you have a master, you have to do what your master says. I mean, and the question is, oh, wait, you know, church finger, Dr. Carr, <laughs> uh, her master are the constituents that voted her in, right? That's the, the, theoretically, theoretically, but you know, we know that there are enough people who are disengaged in the political process that you, your master ultimately is your desire, right? Like what? What are you afraid of? What do you? What do you? You know, and her master is fear. Wow. Wow. I don't. You know, I, I don't want to lose. What don't you? What are you afraid of losing? Take a breath in, take a breath out. You see what that is? That's evidence of the thing that can't be taken away until it's gone. And at that point, we all got to go that way. So, what are you scared of? No, I'm not. No, I'm not talking about uh, political lobbyists. I'm not talking about phone calls. I'm talking about the thing that you are afraid of. What you afraid of? So when you were talking with Keith Ellison, I'm thinking to myself, as you as you talked about, this is a man who has won elective office and the voters for him have been overwhelmingly not people who look like him. This is a man who, as you, you know, you and he collaborating and getting his story out into print into the world. It's a man who came into Islam through the nation of Islam. So, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, and he's not afraid. So if he's not afraid, what's wrong with you sitting down there in Florida? This woman here said this, the cries of Israeli babies and Palestinian babies sound the same to me. I'm trying to understand why they don't sound the same to you. And you got people from that cosplay Jerry Lawler from Florida, Marjorie Taylor Greene, to that on with Christian soldiers, straight fascist Mike Johnson, who's getting ready to default the government in about seven days. And uh, they voting to censor you for saying all these babies cry the same. Why? Because you don't believe that. You're white nationalists. And why would you side with the white nationalists? What you scared of? What are you scared of? You used to teach babies, black babies. You are a principal in a building where other people taught black babies. And you stood and you wear that hat because you say your ancestors, your elders brought you into this. And yet I understand why you're scared. But you're creating you're creating space where we can speak, even speak our fear. We have to speak our fear too. Rashida Tlaib said, I will tell the truth if my voice shakes. And I'm looking, as, as you talked about, you see Corey Bush back there. You see my former student, Summer Lee, sitting back there. I'm very proud. I mean, it's beyond pride. I'm like, whoever don't stand with them. And then those sisters and brothers, and here's Barbara Lee, the elder in the group. And it ain't not even more, a dozen people stand on the steps over there, Jamal Bowman and all them, you know, Rama Paul, and they standing behind the thing. We got to stand with these people and stop and do a ceasefire. Where are the rest of these people? I'm sorry. I understand. Looking for, looking for their money. Uh, so, so his his um, one one of the things that uh, Keith Ellison uh, said that I was surprised that all the attorney generals, not all of them, uh, work together, right? And I was, and I was like, of course, right? Yeah. Just like you know, Tamika, uh, Tiffany Lofton, you know, you you have um, uh, Cliff and Latasha, and like even though they're in different states. Tamika moved to Kentucky for four months with the expressed intent to organize to stop Daniel Cameron. That was it. All the other white nationalists in Kentucky won, except for him. And you saw but you he, saw the vote tally, right? Yes. Yes, I did. Young man, 624,000 yeah. votes or so. Every other state right Republican got at least 700,000, some close to 800,000, meaning them white boys and girls could not bring themselves even to vote for N-word mm -hmm. when they are white nasties. I'm carrying your water. 100,000 votes at least less than everybody else won in statewide. And he, when he went home and, and fell into his, ar his wife's arms and cried, you know, I'm wondering what he told her because I'm sure she voted for him, but I'm not sure that her family did because clearly, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, you think she voted for him? Well, you know, I, 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 I'm sure he would like to think that, young Dan. Mackenzie. Mackenzie. Mac. Hey, man. And look, this is not a dig on interracial relationships. Except oh, I didn't even know. It, it absolutely, well, it absolutely is a full scale assault on interracial relationships if one of those races say they better than the rest. 
So if your whiteness is grounded in the fact that you think somehow your quote unquote race, which isn't real, but it is real because it's, you're, you've constructed it to be real and we suffer. If you think your race is better, then I am absolutely against interracial relationships because you are not, it's not an interracial relationship. It's a racial dominant relationship. And I, I don't know what's in Daniel Cameron's heart as he pines for whatever he's uh, afraid of and secretly loving. But I know one thing, he got to find a job this week. Because to me, yeah, yeah, but- he's like, hell no, my, my young boy uh, uh, down there, Sean <laughs> Ali Mickens, uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, uh, great, uh, ne- great grand nephew, uh, Rahman's grand nephew, who was a senior at Howard, be graduating in December. He was down there. He During COVID, he just he went back home. They're in the streets. So I'm saying, you know, young Dan, find a job and reflect on the fact that over 100,000, close to 200,000 for some of them people, white people who were in the GOP could not bring themselves to vote for you, son. Ask yourself what that is and maybe call Clarence Thomas for some help. Maybe Jenny, and, maybe Jenny and McKenzie can commiserate since Jenny been cutting them chairs. That's where the money going to come from. You know, Jenny got all them chairs. You saw Leonard Leo this week. It's been revealed that, you know, he was telling uh, Kelly Ann Conway to uh, bill, uh, to, to invoice uh, uh, Jenny Thomas, but don't put her name on the invoice. So, I mean, you know, but, you know, it's crazy. The, how the, the level of corruption. Oh, you know, my God. As, as we navigate these waters and, and they get murkier and weirder and the, mm-hmm. the currents are changing in real time, you know, I, I think about all of the, you know, the truths that are self-evident that aren't really evident at all. And, and how, to your point, you know, our showing up to, to elect judges, to elect district attorneys, to elect the folk that will determine our outcomes, not today, but tomorrow, right? You're, you're not voting for right now. You're voting for two, three, four, five years, 10 years from now. You, As we saw with Roe v. Wade and affirmative action, you're never voting for right now. You're voting for down the line for somebody else, actually. And if we can't, if we don't have the capacity to vote for other people's rights and things, even if we don't have them right now and uh, the tangibles that people think that they want, and that's why they're not voting, you only get them through <laughs> elected officials. That It's lawmakers that make your tangibles real, right? So uh, sitting home, I don't know what your plan is for tangibles if you're not going to elect people who are going to get them for you. Well, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's weird. For, your plan is to vote for... Um... What vote for to vote for the white nationalists if you're okay. playing at home, and 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 again, I mean, you know, I'm sure that this will be clipped and uh yes, and put out, please, as, you know, please, right? You know, as, as ads for the Democratic Party, of course, anybody who does that is opening their mouth or their device and putting their brain on display. This is uh, I like what Mike Harriet said in, in this regard. He said, You're not voting Democrat, Republican, Independent, you're voting for black people. You're voting your interest. What is your interest? And in a two-party system that hasn't been dismantled, and certainly we see that voting is no panacea. We saw what happened in Ohio. You know, the people of Ohio said, we want to put a woman's right to choose what to do with her body in the Ohio Uh Constitution. Mm -hmm. And so at least a couple of dozen white nationalists have now said that they're going to try to strip the courts of the ability to interpret the Constitution. I'm loving it. I'm absolutely here for it because you're going to tear it up. I've been telling what what are we been talking about for three and a half years? You're going to tear it up. And when you tear it up, you're not going to be able to put it back together. So now you're saying judges can't interpret the Constitution. The sole thing that they are on the bench to do. They're saying, yeah, good, do it. Why? Because when you tear it up, and those of us who have a common humanity come together and say, we're going to build something new. And you come in the room. I didn't. Mm-mm, no, no, because no, because we voted for this. And then you try to take these white boys in Ohio. Uh, there's no chain. They've never been on a chain, much less to be off one. But I'm just saying all that to say that, you know, we can't be naive at this point. No, no. Come on back. Come on back. I, I just wanted to mention that because they ain't on a chain. <laughs> I ain't off the chain. No, but the only reason I bring that up is because people think that people who are talking about voting strategically, voting intelligently, trying to marshal power, somehow think that that's going to solve everything. No, it is one tool in the box. And does Jill Stein help by jumping in the Green Party? Because Cornell decided he ain't going to jump in. So now I'm going to get on the ballot and run again. I'm not voting for Jill Stein. I'm not voting for Cornell West. I'm not voting for Robert Kennedy Jr. I'm voting for black people. What is going to get us in the best position to be able to? And, 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 and finally, we have to think about this, it seems to me. I love the way that, you know, Tamika's comrade and sister Linda Sarsour says, she said, put your best opponent in the political office. If you can't get the person you want, get your best opponent. 
These people are the people who are at least pushing for certain things are our best opponent. Why? You can bang on them a little harder. <laughs> you understand? These white nasties, if you want to fight them, it's not going to be in the legislature. It's going to be in the street. Even though I do think with this, you saw the case, you know, the, 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 the domestic violence case this week at the Supreme Court. It looks like Clarence Thomas and Sammy Lito, the only ones on the bench, if we take the oral arguments, the, you know, who have any appetite for allowing a man who is convicted of domestic abuse, shooting at people, right, to still have a gun. They seem to be the only two. But the problem they have, of course, is that last year in that Brewer case, that New York case, you basically said, if it ain't in the damn Constitution of 1787, then it doesn't count. But now John Roberts and Kavanaugh and the handmaid got to figure out how, because Katanji Brown Jackson was firing true bullets from the bench. Like, see what y'all did last year? Uh-huh. You going you gonna to let this guy who beat up the woman who killed, you know, and then shot at everybody? You going to let him keep his gun? Let's talk. John Roberts somewhere with the rest of his hair falling out because he got to figure out now. That rogue ass Fifth Circuit down there in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, that Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, you didn't, no, no, you don't caught the car now. What did the Joker say in Batman? He said, I'm like the dog chasing the car. If the car if I ever catch it, I ain't gonna know what to do with it. John Roberts is the Joker. You are, you have caught the car, baby. And now your country about to fall apart. So, I mean, you got nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. It's here now. What are we gonna do? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just come back to you and Tamika. You know, you got to confront it. And what did you say? I love when she was talking, you know, we got to be able to convert protest into politics. And you said, well, sis, I ain't, you, you didn't call it a friendly amendment. But said, and then she said, I love that. Protest the power. What did you mean by that, Professor Hunter? No, I mean, we, you know, we have been in the streets and I, you know, I've been one uh, critical of just marching. Of course. You know, mar marching without. You know, you got to be first, of course. Always. I've always, I've always been, you know, very critical, even when I didn't know what I was talking about, of just marching. And if we aren't going to, and she demonstrated what that looked like, to show up, move somewhere, organize against a particular singular, and, and being laser beam focused that this man cannot sit in the governor's mansion. I don't give a damn what else we get to do. This will not happen. And to put your full force behind it, that's power. Now, the person who is elected in that seat, you know, now there's a conversation being had, you know, now it's coming. And I listened to Andy Bashir's um acceptance speech, and it sounded a lot like there's no red states and blue states, but the United States. And I, I was I sat up and I said, huh, huh, okay, people are moving away from R's and D's, from you know, left and right, and starting to realize that it's we the people. And when we the people show up, that's power. When we show up economically or don't show up economically, boycotts and boycotts, that's power. We actually have more power when we work collectively. And what Tamika and so many others are doing is that behind the scenes, whether we're talking about New York, Lurie and, and Jennifer Jones Austin and, and those yes. folks that are changing yeah. the constitution literally in New York, yes. putting it on the ballot. Yeah. Uh, and now no, watching, no, no question. watching uh, Mayor Adams, uh, mm, mm, this is... Run, baby. <laughs> Man, they taking this bro phone with nowhere to hide, baby. Someone's like, uh, I, I find it curious that the, you know, uh, they, it's like they are, you know, targeting him. I was like, what black man in his right mind thought that he could? Well, they did it. Like that can't be. That, no, that can never be your uh, defense. I'm sorry. Listen, uh, you're, you're and, and you know, you know, we saw what happened to Marilyn Mosby day for yesterday. Ooh, That's oh. what I'm saying. They out here baking. I mean, but but when have they not? If y'all read my, my friend uh, Derek Musgrove's book on black political elected officials and the persecute, it, we, we take that as a given. You better pay all your taxes. You better turn around. And if you didn't, you better hurry up and get it right. You got to go. Because look, the minute you win, you're in the bullseye. That's it. And Eric Adams, come on, bro. You can't do. <laughs> you know what it, you know what it said to me? Um, he was a career uh law enforcement. Yeah. And all it uh, career. Uh so it feels to me that maybe that body is inherently corrupt. So it's it, they're so used to getting away with things. As I watch the police officer that caused the death of Elijah McClain mm. walk away scot free and you know, we know Breonna Taylor, Daniel Cameron. She was on the ballot in Kentucky. Oh, uh, as much as white people couldn't vote for him, black folk were going to vote for him because he was black. Because you know, Al Green got into Congress primarily because his name was Al Green. No question. You know, we, we, no, no we, question. We, you know, we tend to we tend to be complicated. But you know, as as I'm looking at you know this lawman 
this law man Bass Reeves, which was another. I was like, what? Wait a minute, on, on the wrong side you were fighting. I'm like, I didn't know this, right? So I'm learning. But maybe that. I mean, the Buffalo it. Soldiers were on the wrong side. I just, you know, I mean, we, of course, Joe you know, Horn writes about that in the category. Oh my God. They, they, they but we're conditioned to be proud, right? So I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm twisting and turning, figuring out. Okay, all right, I'm learning this stuff, and now I got to do something with it, right? That's you right. can't just can't sit and wrong anymore. You gotta once you know better, you gotta do better. So I'm sitting mm-hmm. there like, uh, career law enforcement. We think of that as an honorable position until we realize how much you get away with. Because you have a badge, you can you have you you can be judged during an execution, or many times are, um, and never held accountable, you know, yeah. except for a few cases. So I mean, it, it, it's difficult, I, and this is a very important conversation for us to have. And again, I'm just grateful for us having it on Saturdays and us having it in Nubia narrative, but also really foundationally springing from you having it five days a week on Sirius and bringing people in of across the political range. We have to talk about it. And like you said, with Laree, Eljoy, Autumn, I mean, Laree's here in the chat. I see her in the, in the new you know, new, Laree don't mean, you know, shout out to you, sis, because political education, as Eljoy always says, and you, you shouted her out. You were you talking about her last week as well. It's a thing where we have to constantly educate ourselves. And, 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 and you're right. I mean, we're not going to win everything, of course, but, you know, you don't quit the arena. So Eric Adams, bro, you you just in trouble. You know, you're in trouble now. And, you know, when you look for people to have your back, people understand that we can't get everything we want in politics, but you don't leave the fight. So it has to be, uh, it, it, it's a different kind of conversation we have to have. And and I'm and I appreciate you 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 know being at the center of that and standing there for people to have it because they're out here trying to stop people from talking. But let me ask you why why do, didn't CNN or why didn't you know Joe Scarborough and his uh, partner and uh, Mika and uh, why don't you think they mentioned Breonna Taylor last week? They seemed to make Kentucky all about abortion. I, I don't. I know why Andy Bashir didn't have no black people up there on the stage. I understand because his red states, blue states, like the chocolate wonder, Barack Obama, it's aspirational, <laughs> and you understand the real politics. You can't have too many black people. So I understand that. But 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 how, how do Negroes contort themselves? And by Negroes here, I'm not using it racially. I'm using it here to talk about these white nasties. You saw white nasties on television and mass entertainment media. Why can't they put Breonna Taylor's name in their mouth and understand what just happened in Kentucky? <laughs> I don't think they. I don't think they do understand what's happening. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, I, I I sit in a unique position, um, talking to people, regular ass people all over the country, and and some parts of Puerto Rico, definitely Puerto Rico, some parts of Mexico, and some parts of Toronto, Monday through Friday. I have a unique position uh, to be able to talk to people, and so it allows me to see things and to know things that um, people who are cosplaying as producers. Uh, Cause they they are cosplaying. Y'all y'all ain't out there in the streets. It's like editors when I was at the Daily News, sending me out to cover a story that they have no idea what's out there till I get there. So I have two decisions: do I follow what my editor tells me the story is, or do I actually go get the story? You know. And at some point, you go get the story because that's mm-hmm. that's your that's your job, right? Once you realize uh, that your job's not social climbing, but it's actually to get to get to the truth. So you co- can come back and challenge your editor. No, 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 that's not. That's not what happened. Or or why don't we also consider this? You know, because you're not out there. You didn't talk to these people. So I'm talking to people every day, which is why I knew Trump was going to win. I could hear it. You know, I know that Biden's in Trump. I can hear it. At the same time, uh, Tuesday gave me optimism that folk are going to show up, you know, and that the silent majority is a real thing, which I also understand. But I feel like people are living in a country that they don't really know because they don't live in a the country. They live in their silos. They live in their pockets and yeah. they're informing they're producing based on what they think is instead of what really is. Right. So yeah. that's why they don't know. That's why they don't know. And, and the people, the black people, they surround themselves with just want to be pick me Negroes. They just want to be, which I love Tamika for saying she was, she was saying something. She was saying something. Y'all, if y'all were listening yes, about leadership and, you know, Mark Morial with the camera up his nostrils and all of that, just, you know, I'm, I'm bringing him up because, <laughs> As a clear example of somebody oh. to be in the room, got a whole documentary, Gumbo. I almost watched it and I was like, I am not giving you any ratings, sir. I know who you are now. Um, and you know, I, I anyway, I'm gonna say no, that. no, 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 anyway, you're right. I mean, I think about George Packer's book, uh, he and his wife driving from coast to coast and uh, listening to people, sitting with people in their book, The, the Great Unwinding. 
and I've been working my way slowly through Heather Cox Richardson's new book, Democracy Awakening, you know, um, where she's doing something similar. The only thing is that, you know, I think Packer has, at least as far as I've been reading so far in Richardson, a more um, clear eyed assessment. It's closer to somebody like a Chris Hedges, although he's not Chris Hedges by any stretch of imagination in terms of his prescription. There's no there's no there's no rational. There's no logical. There's no realistic expectation that any of these countries will be countries in 100 years or 200 years. I mean, the United States probably ran its course. It's going to be around for the foreseeable future. It may even limp along for the next few centuries. But, uh, you know, even as Joe Biden meets with Xi Jinping, not in uh, Beijing, but in San Francisco next week. Uh, first thing I, I thought about was, of course, uh, Philip Dick's short uh, novel that turned into the television series on HBO, The Man in the High Castle. Uh, oh, you're meeting the Chinese in San Francisco and not in China. Why? Because San Francisco is China shortly, Chief. Uh, especially when you start looking at your real estate portfolio. And I think we both and I all saw WeWork go bankrupt this week. Ooh, please say that. Come on, come on back, Prof. How do you make sense of this? This is one of the reasons I love this Saturday because we get to suss through some things that you've brought up. But, but I mean, what, what does that tell you when WeWork go, and the bank that funded them, SoftBank? What does that tell you, <laughs> Prof? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, just, somebody go bankrupt. I'm saying they lost their money. Right. No, they did. And, I'm, and I've been contemplating this, too, you know, as we as we are in this, quote unquote, capitalist and it is capitalism mm -hmm. uh, society. You know, what is business? Mm -hmm. you know, what is business? And and what's our response? Like we we again are conditioned to, you know, 47 billion dollar valuation. Elon Musk gets to buy Twitter, 44 billion dollars, not having to give up one single dime or cash out anything like it's all smoke right. and mirrors. Right. It's all smoke That's and mirrors. Right. And so, right. so, but but I know when I pay my mortgage, it's not smoking mirrors, it's real dollars, right? Real so I don't, dollars. Get to, I don't get to um just say, hey, hey bank, you know, you know, I got it. Just, say, just <laughs> got it. I'm good for it. I'm good for it. You know, we don't all get to do that. So I feel like you know, at, at some point, real reality has to set in, and we well, have to what, demand what, it. Too. You said that you just asked, what is business? I mean, you know, here's one. Uh, the, I was tripped this week. You know. Sandy Wheel apparently was uh, uh, was uh, the boy J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon's mentor, not Jegna. I will not use that term in the social structure formations for other people. I'll use Jegna in our terms. But he said, you know, if you're a CEO of one of our big criminal enterprises and these big banks and lending, uh, you shouldn't divest yourself of stock until you retire, until you leave or retire or leave. Well, the news came today. Uh, uh, this week, Diamond joins parade of bankers ditching stock. So he just uh, divested himself. He's got $1.2 billion of stock in J.P. Morgan Chase, but he just sold a million shares worth about $140 million. So how do we trace to the to the question you're raising, what is business? How do we trace when these boys get nervous? Mm. Because now they starting to sell their stock in their in their criminally profitable criminal enterprise banks. And, you know, WeWork goes bankrupt. Jamie Dimon sells $140 million of his stock after his man's told him don't sell stock. If you And he's not alone. So prop, prop, I guess what I'm asking is, as an astute observer and someone who has her pulse not only on what people are saying in the street, but also processing that against a lifetime of looking at how systems operate, particularly the one we're in, how should we, where can we look to for clues as to what direction these folks are making decisions in in this social structure we live in. You were doing it, you know, from the Financial Times, which you got me reading now, you know, which is global. You know, you're doing it. You're do, you're showing us. I, I haven't seen papers held up since my daddy used to read them. <laughs> we ain't gonna bring papers back, but at least we oh can. Oh my goodness, it, it is so refreshing. You know, because this is how you actually understand it, not through scrolling. Mm -hmm. Not through scrolling, but how it's laid out. But also these, you also know that these publications are are um, in league with, you know, the... Oh, yeah. oh they're, tra they're trash. Yes. But, I mean, they're trash in that sense, but you're right. You can't do it. Like, let me let me see here. This is... Always, it's always hidden, though. Go ahead. Tell us. All, no, no. It always... It is always hidden. In fact, let me let me see if I can... Uh, I want to... Because there are a couple of things I want to talk about today in the context of this overarching theme, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The places to run and hide from confronting these things 
are increasingly uh, increasingly rare. And this conflict in occupied Palestine is making it impossible for people to hide. I'm hoping I can find this quickly. This is yesterday's paper, so I know it is here. This is the kill story I was looking for. Oh, wait a minute. Hold up. Let me, uh, yeah, yeah. Because I thought even when we were talking, it made me think about Jamie Dimon and losing this money. But yeah, the thing, and what you just said as well, you can't get it by scrolling. You've got to see how conversations are put in conversation with other conversations. So there's a story in here about, obviously, the, the story that's everywhere is this ongoing slaughter in Israel. Hold on. It might be over there. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll find it in a minute. Here it is right here. All right. But like, here's the context, right? Israel's October 7 intelligence failure spawns doctrine of preemptive action. We'll come back to the Israeli intelligence folk in a minute. That's the headline. But in the newspaper, as opposed to scrolling, you'll see here's the inset. See, here's the picture. They're talking about, you know, authorities accused of ignoring warnings, discounting dangers, putting too much faith in tech. They bury the lead, which is Israeli government been propping up Hamas for years in order to use them as a counterweight against first the Palestinian Liberation Organization, now the Palestinian Authority, which has lost all credibility among the people living in West Bank and Gaza. But they want to prop them up. This two state solution, which is a canard in many ways. Uh, being propped up now. Now, Tony Blinken, the Where's Waldo of the of the Biden administration, the, again, put your best opponent in uh, office because, you know, you put the white nationalists in and they're going to come to the meeting with the Bible talking about this has to happen. We have to do this so that Jesus can come. And you talk about anti-Semites here. Yeah, that's who you will be putting back in office. <laughs> and that's not going to be your best opponent unless you think you just need to get in the street and fight somebody. And just in case you didn't know, I don't know how many of us have the nuclear codes, but that's a story for another day because I, I love these revolutionaries that think this is going to be fought out with guns in the street. But the point is this. While all that's going on, they're talking about, the you know, the intelligence failure. Look at the inset. This is what you get in the physical paper. What's this little shady uh, rectangle here? Shaded rectangle, slightly shaded rectangle with another story. Oh, what's this? Here it is. The inset calls for journalists who took photos of Hamas raid to be treated as terrorists. What? So I'm reading this and I'm like, hmm, 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 what the hell? Israeli officials have said that a group of freelance Palestinian photographers and you, of course, Professor Hunter, as a credentialed, faded and awarded and very highly respected and honored, not only journalist, but teacher of trainer of journalists. I'm sure this sends a chill through your spine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Israeli officials have said that a group of freelance Palestinian photographers who transmitted images of the October 7 Hamas raid to international media should be treated as terrorists claiming they had prior knowledge of the attack. The journalists in question sent images of the assault in which at least 1,400 Israelis were killed, according to Israeli officials, to clients such as the Associated Press and CNN. Former Defense Minister Benny Gantz, a member of Israel's war cabinet, said yesterday that, quote, this is a direct quote, journalists found to have known about the massacre and who still chose to stand as idle bystanders while children were slaughtered Again, Rashida Tlaib saying the sound of all the children sound the same to me. Why don't they sound the same to you, uh, Mr. Gantz? He says, and uh, are no different than terrorists and should be treated as such, end quote. Danny Darren, Israel's representative at the United Nations, Linda Greenfield, what you doing? I know what you're doing. You got to do your master's bidding. I'm sorry, you, you, the one that hired you. Danny Darren. Dannon, rather, Danny Dannon, Israel's representative to the UN, said Israel had a list of people it would, quote, this is a direct quote, eliminate, end quote, for participating in the raid. Quote, the photojournalists who took part in recording the assault will be added to that list, end quote. He said on X, formerly Twitter, finally. Israeli officials claimed that the photographers must have had advanced knowledge of the raid to take the photos, but provided no evidence to support this allegation. The raid involved thousands of people, lasted several hours and was widely known in Gaza while it was ongoing, drawing massive crowds of onlookers near the Borden border fence. So if you took a picture and sent it to CNN, Israelis and put you on a list and you will be eliminated. You understand? You get this book right here, Rise and Kill First. 
This is Ronan Bergman's book, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations. We're going to kill you because we think there it is. Okay, which put? So, no, go ahead. Keep talking. Keep talking. Mm -hmm. So I, um, yesterday when I was I was in, in my journalism class, um, I think Sherilyn Eiffel shared this clip of Charles Ogletree talking uh -huh. to journalists oh, yes. about war. Yeah, and yeah. so we, we watched it. We went through it because the question was, you know, uh, at what point do you, which side are you on? Are you right. a journalist or are you, you know, and it was profound, you know, as I watched Mike Wallace and Peter Jennings kind of like wrestle with this in real time. And it was so pure in terms of their like, and you get to see that. And I yeah. was like, are, do we have journalism like this today? It was inspiring at the same time, sad mm -hmm. uh, for me. And then you're telling me, you know, uh, <laughs> people are going to be labeled terrorists. but Because they took a picture. And everybody out there taking a picture. And they're being employed by CNN and AP. And now they're going to put their name on a list to kill them. To kill them. But of course, it won't be hard to kill them since they're bombing indiscriminately and the cowardly social structure uh, news entertainment media press has worked overtime to conflate Hamas with every Palestinian. So if you're a three second old baby in a hospital that's been bombed, you must be Hamas. So guess what? There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Everybody's being laid bare now. The lights are on, CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Financial Times. The lights are on, Joe and Mika. You can keep saying Hamas. New York Times, you can you can change your language to a death toll by the Hamas controlled. OK, why don't you say death toll uh, uh, by the Israel controlled? No, you can't. Right? You can stop. But it's nowhere to run. People not listen. Y'all no more. You can mm -hmm. you can you can try to ban student organizations, including Jewish Voices for Peace, Columbia University. But there's mm -hmm. nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Harvard, you can come up with an anti-Semitism task force that will exclude the Arabs and the Muslims. But there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. People not listening to y'all no more. What you're threatening is not the people you are trying to keep in line. What you're threatening is your ability to do anything. After that. I mean, I, I, I saw the, the backfire of it. It was like so clear. Like you don't see that by labeling journalists terrorists and then calling for their death for taking a picture, which as Americans, you know, freedom of the press is constitutional, right? It's one of our, you know, I, how is that not going to backfire? It's rhetorically constitutional, but we know what happens to our photographers. We could ask Manetta Slett from Ebony Magazine over the years. We know what happens to our journalists. We can ask Charles Loeb, who we talked about two years ago with the call and post, who broke the stories on what was going on on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as you talked about, Prof, when we talked about, we could talk about our people who were embedded on this Veterans Day, which we talked about extensively in our archive. You can go back and look at our conversations around Veterans Day. We could talk about that. We could talk about the fact that Ida Wells could not return to Memphis as we the first of the in-classes. All that, all those times ago, 192 moments together ago, we could talk about Ida Well saying, "You're not gonna kill my friends. You're not gonna kill my friend and take him away from his children, his wife, his partner, his his business partner, because they had a grocery store called the People's Grocery in Memphis, and y'all came and lynched him. Y'all, uh, y'all not gonna do that, and I'm not gonna talk about it in my newspaper. And you can burn my printing press there. I'll come back and rebuild it. Had to be convinced to leave Memphis and go back to Chicago. So we know our our journalists know what this is." We can talk about Walter White and his book, Rope and Faggot. Rope, meaning the lynch. Faggot, meaning the piece of wood that you twist and light on fire to, to bake somebody. We could talk about the fact that he would go and interview these white boys and then leave. And then here come the police and the Klan, which is the same thing, saying, we heard it was a white it was a white man around here or a black man around here interviewing people. Who? What? That dude was black? <laughs> yeah. So we know what it's like to be in harm's way. But these people then told the world, if you took a picture, you on a list and we're going to kill you. We're going to eliminate you for taking a picture because you're a terrorist. What's your evidence? My evidence is me. My evidence is me. So, you know, I mean, we talk about, you know, nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. You know, what are you running from? What are you scared of? And where are you hiding and why do you hide? What is, con you know, does context matter? Does being silent matter? If you've got nowhere to run and nowhere to hide and what this this configuration is going and it's not to with all due respect to all of our 
family who are saying as African people, we shouldn't be, we should be focused on Africa, millions in the Congo displaced and dying, of course, the battle for resources there, even as we must pay attention to the fact that somewhere about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, um, millions of cubic feet of natural gas were identified uh, officially as being under in the ocean about 17 to 21 nautical miles off the coast of Gaza. And that on October the 30th of this year, October, while this war, while not war, I call it a war, while this slaughter, while this genocide, and I didn't study, go look at the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights there for yesterday, who said this needs to be uh this needs to be fomented as a war crime before the International Criminal Court. This is an act of genocide by the United the United Nations Convention Against Genocide. Black people, again, being no strangers to that, we've talked about the 1951 petition. We charge genocide. William Patterson and W.E.B. Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois and S.E. Robeson and Paul Robeson and so many others who, who joined that petition. But uh, while this is going on, on October the 30th of this year, October the 30th, meaning uh, week for last, Israel uh, entered another deal with a half dozen more energy companies to tap into that natural gas. Now, according to the Oslo Accords, 93, 1993, the Accords would set the Palestinians up for more slaughter, again, creating the fiction that there will ever be a Palestinian state if these folk in this social structure have anything to do about it. According to those accords, which they violated while the ink was being spilled into the paper, according to those accords, Gaza is supposed to share in and have control of, I think it, I think the, the outer limit of the water off the coast of Gaza is 20 miles. So you found the natural gas between 17 and 21 miles. And while you killing people in hospitals, while you bombing camps, while you telling people to go south, then bomb the road as they going, while you telling people to go south and as they get there, you bomb the place they went. Yeah, while, while you're doing that, you sign contracts with a half dozen energy companies to tap into gas that it's illegal for you to uh, do that with without sharing with the get with the people in Gaza. But guess what? It was never your intent to do that. So so yes, we, we shouldn't be involved in this. We're already involved in it because the war isn't about Arabs versus Jews. It isn't about Palestinians versus Israelis. Not only all of that, it's about resources. It's about natural gas. It's about that Ben-Gurion Canal that those of us in Nubia talked about on Monday night when we were looking, pulled up the articles that talking about this canal that once completed, and it goes through Gaza, once completed, will, um, will replace or eliminate or greatly reduce the need for the Suez Canal, you know. So, so set aside for a minute the war criminal, Benjamin not Netanyahu, BB. Set aside BB. Set aside that member of his war cabinet that is US raised, that is a right winger who is the back channel guy and the front channel guy between the US government and the Israeli government. Set aside even momentarily the people of Israel many of whom are millions in Israel. I'm not even talking about folks who are outside of Israel, but are in Israel opposing this violence, who they are attempting to silence. Again, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Just understand that all these moving parts, there are deep interests in this, deep interests invested in this, and we can't look away as human beings. And that includes African people, maybe the first people. I, I'm not one of those people who deals with this question of hierarchies of who should be most invested. But let me be very clear as an African person. If this were 1831, Nat Turner would be the terrorist. If this were 1822, Denmark Vesey would be the terrorist. If 1859, Harriet Tubman would be the terrorist. If this were uh, 1800, Gabriel Prosser would be the terrorist. If it was 1739, those who involved themselves in the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina would be the terrorists. If it was Pointe Coupe in Louisiana, they would be the terrorists. The Haitians would be the terrorists. They would be the international pariahs. Toussaint Louverture, Henri Christophe, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, uh, Cecile Fatima, and Bookman Duddy, and all them Africans. They would be the terrorists. So don't be so quick to side with your master. Because your master has an interest that you don't have. And if you think somehow that you're going to put the people who the onward Christian soldiers, white nasties, clan adjacent Israel got to uh, do this so that Jesus can come back people in, back in. 
to understand that you already got one of them as the speaker of the house, although he probably won't be the speaker this time next week. Because uh, either the government is going to uh, default and the government, oh, the government's going to close down, either the government's going to shut down, or Mickey J, Mikey Johnson, is going to have to make a deal with the Democrats, at which point hang Mike Johnson will be the shout from the Matt Gates low forehead lurch off the Munsters faction of the White Nationalist Party because they're going to hang him too politically because you can't make no deals. It's rule or ruin. If you want to see a preview of what it looks like, if you're just going to hold on to your narrow ideology and not try to get in the arena and figure out what the best thing you can do, what you can do in a short term to try to help protect your people's interests in a place where there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, don't look at the, the Marxists and the socialists and the black nationalists. Go, no, 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 pan Africans. Go, go look at the white nationalists. Go look at the white nationalists. So, but we're all here, right? We're all on this ball. There's no black air, no white air. There's no Arab or Jew air. There's no Israeli or Palestinian air. There's air, there's land, there's water. And everybody lives someplace, to quote you, Professor Hunter, when you're talking to Tamika Mallory the other day. What happens when you don't have a place to live? And how do we imagine living? What is place? So this week I was thinking about, as we're finalizing the details for um, summer 2023, August 2024, rather, in Kemet, trying to, you know, keep the prices as low as we can and, and making some last minute arrangements to make that happen. Uh, realizing, of course, that, you know, people are thinking twice about traveling. This is all over the news too, all the news across the range that this war will quote unquote spill over. I'm sure you all saw the chair of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Mr. Brown, Brother Brown, black man, air, coming out the Air Force, say that, in fact, he was quoted on Thursday being interviewed saying that this has to stop because all you're doing is creating a situation where you're going to multiply the people who will die before they stop fighting you. So now the Joint Chiefs of Staff has said it. I don't care what the mummy say. He's our best opponent right now. Because if you think Donald Trump is your best opponent, then you probably need your head examined or you must got some nuclear launch codes and a portal to an alternative universe so that when you've made this place unlivable, you're going to slip into the alternate Earth. But that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's not the real world. The point is that Brown is like, this got to stop. And Blinken, the Where's Waldo of the uh, Biden administration, is going around trying to, you know, he didn't met with everybody now. You meet with the Palestinian Authority. You know who listens to the Palestinian Authority? The people who prop them up, meaning what? You and Israel. And Israel don't trust them. You've been propping up Hamas for years. Now you're shocked, shocked in intelligence phase. Well, well maybe you want this war, BB, so you can knock the, the glass pitcher over in the meeting so that you can stay out of jail. But while all, all these moving parts are going on, you know, people are rethinking whether or not they want to go into the region that is uh, that that historic Palestine is surrounded by. And that includes Egypt. So as we are making plans for August 2024, we're well aware that August 24 is an eternity away. But as, we, as we're making plans, I was sitting here thinking about August 2023, August of this year, thinking about coming back from uh, Abu Simbel and that long ride of, you know, five hours, five, six hours going near the Sudan border and coming back and brother Stacy, shout out to Stacy, a brother from Texas playing as the brothers summer breeze. And we're riding through the desert and you looking at the sun going down and you just had this powerful witness experience of what these Africans built, the genius of architecture and literature, the genius of ways of knowing etched into stone for a very long time and listening to summer breeze play. And just, you know, asking myself again, you know, what does it mean, as we talked about last week, uh, what does it mean to be part of a diaspora? And I'm increasingly kind of stepping away from that term diaspora because place, you know, everybody lives someplace. But how closely do we identify a physical place? And physical place is very important with the place that we live in our hearts. And as we're riding, you know, at that moment, I'm in Kemet. I'm in ancient Kemet. I'm at an Isley Brothers concept. 
concert. I'm in Nashville as a little boy watching my father clean up the house and participating in that as my mom is around there and he's humming to himself, them Isley Brothers songs. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, this isn't diaspora. It's all those places at the same time. It is, you know, it, it's global Africana. Let's set all that aside. Let's set aside the idea that we should identify only with the people who came into it, the world in the place where we were born, even though there are cradle cities as is talked about in the ancient Egyptian text of Sinue. You know, come back to the black land. Literally, Jacob Carruthers' translation, come back to the black land. You know, come back. It's the place where you came into existence. Place does matter. You know, God knows. I haven't seen Christmas decorations now all over the place. What the hell's going on? Oh, you skipped over the genocide holiday, but the Thanksgiving, but it ain't even a genocide holiday. Well, it's a return to place, physical place. So place does matter. But but what is place? And what happens when place is memory? What happens when place is under assault? What happens when you don't have a place? What happens when you don't have a place? What value is, is memory when you don't have that place? And so, you know, I've been thinking about all that, you know, what and how does place hold us together? And so, Prof, when you said to Tamika, everybody lives someplace. Think about all these human beings under assault in Congo, in Haiti, all these human beings are under assault in historic Palestine, all these human beings were under assault in Israel and those who want for the killing to stop every place who are now being assaulted by people who have different commitments than they have, who are scared of something else, scared of going to jail, BB, scared of losing the deal for the natural gas, scared that they won't be able to ship their big shipping containers on these big transport ships through the Bengarian Canal that they're trying to build. There's other types of fear in capitalism. Fear maybe that the market is a little unstable. Huh, Jamie Dimon selling $140 million of stock after your man told you never sell the stock and you got more money. It's the biggest bank in the damn country is JP Morgan, but guess what? Why are you selling stock? Oh, you read the same papers I read, but by the time I read it, you've known that a month ago. Everybody, all y'all knew that we work was going out of business. Why? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to trust you or my lying, eye, my lying eyes when I'm walking around and seeing all these damn buildings in downtown D.C., in midtown New York, where your headquarters is dark in the middle of the day. So I know what's going on. But that's a different command interest than somebody whose baby just died, whose mama's just died, who's using his hands to try to find his son in the rubble, who's using her hands to try to find her daughter in the rubble. And the bombs keep dropping that we paid for. So everybody lives someplace until there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And so at that moment, you know, what we've witnessed this last month plus now is blending places in ways that prop up people who don't have our common humanity as their interests. Blending Jewish and Israel. You can't do that. Because once you do that, you know who you put a target on? You put a target on everybody who says they're Jewish. Including all the people like Jewish Voices for Peace. And then Columbia says, we got to ban you. Why? You calling for peace. You calling for this terrorist. Really? So is every Jew an Israeli? Theoretically, you want to give everybody who says they're Jewish a passport to go to Israel. Why are you concentrating this physical place with this thing? You put a target on all those people's back. Even the people say, well, I'm Jew. OK, well, I'm against this. No, and then you're not. OK, so we got to separate Zionism from Judaism. Oh, here we go again. You've conflated Muslim with Palestinian. But what is a Palestinian? What is an Israeli? What is a human being with no place to run, no place to hide? And now what is a kill box where the world is looking as and, and increasingly protesting as you are literally killing people by the thousands and the tens of thousands. And even to narrate it as children and women. So men are okay, Hamas is okay. Okay, let's stipulate that Hamas is okay to attack. It says you're gonna have a war. I mean, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna kill people in Hamas and Hezbollah. How many? People in Hamas and Hezbollah have you killed? Uh, if you took a picture, you're a terrorist. Okay, I see what you're doing. You want to conflate all these identities because everybody lives someplace, but in order for you to continue with your kill mission, you got to make this thing so indistinguishable that you can justify your murder. And what we've been witnessing is this, blending this physical place with possibilities and prescriptions, imposing an impossible burden 
in an impossible situation. So when you have no place to run, no place to hide, you do things out of desperation. Right now it's protest. But as Professor Hunter reminded us the other day, talking to Tamika Mallory, you move from protest to power. And as Tamika reminded us, you get in the streets, you stay in the streets, you organize in the streets, you connect in the streets, you connect that work in the streets to work other places, and young Dan Cameron loses an election. And Mr. Puffy Vest, Glenn Youngkin, got to rethink whether he gonna try to pull a, a oblique on Donald Trump and slide up into the DMs of the 2024 election cycle. Can't do it, Glenn, why? Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. If, I, if I'm elected, I'm going to pass the 15-week abortion ban. Well, we'll take care. I mean, if the legislature says Republican, we're going to pass. Okay, well, we'll take care of that. Well, it ain't going to be Republican. Put your best enemy in the Virginia legislature. Both sections of the legislature. Senate, House of Delegates. You know what? People say, I'm not voting for anyone. The party's the same. Ask a woman desperate for health care that needs to terminate a pregnancy. Ask a woman with an ectopic pre pregnancy. Ask somebody who, yeah, ask, ask her whether or not both parties are the same. Don't be stupid or be stupid. It really doesn't matter to me because my faith is that if you're human, you got a brain. If you got a brain, you can think. And all we have to do is continue to expose, to learn, to think together, and we can overcome this because Glenn Youngkin is very sad in the State House in Virginia this week because people stripped him of places to run and hide as he tried to sneak his way into perhaps the presidency of the United States. You know, Nimrata Haley arguing with Vivek Ramashami uh, in the uh, debate last week, the white nationalist debate, GOP debate, after Ramashami attacks Kristen Welker as his opening salvo. Well, guess what? The reality is ain't none of y'all gonna be president of the United States because even if Letish James or, you know, succeeds, or even if our sister Fannie Willis succeeds and they put Donald Trump in jail, he gonna appeal. And if he can get back in there, he'll pardon himself from the federal stuff, Jack, up here in DC. But at the end of the day, the white nationalists are running rampant in Ohio. They're running rampant in West Virginia. Everybody see you cosplay coal miner Joe Manchin. Everybody see you, baby. You think you're gonna get with this no labels and run for president. Because your number one interest is the party called Joe Manchin. <laughs> you don't give a damn. Your fear is poverty. So you line up with all the millionaires possible to quote Gil Scott Heron. And you know, I'm not I'm not gonna run. When I was a child, my father, we looked at John F. Kennedy. Quit bringing the ghost of John F. Kennedy up. Shit, he, his nephew crazy. <laughs> so he running for president too. Don't get distracted. The point is this. When there's no place to run and nowhere to hide, we're all on the front lines. And the illusion is that there are places to run and places to hide. Whether it be the environment, whether it be the economy, whether it be political conditions, whether it be the threat of violence, there really is no place to run, no place to hide. And what this conflict in historic Palestine is showing us is that it's given us a focal point now to rethink the entire thing. You know, I was in Panera yesterday and it was raining here in the DC area. It was in a Panera and it was packed. It was clear that people who would normally be outside or in the way places, they just came in there. And I didn't even see a whole lot of people in line buying stuff. So, you know, I got my coffee. I'm reading the paper. I'm working. I got letters of recommendation to write and emails to return, all this kind of thing. And so I said, I just post up over here for an hour or two. And, you know, and I haven't had a cup of caffeinated coffee since before we left for Kim. And I'm trying to, you know, because God knows, you know, and tomorrow ain't promised. I got to go to a ritual uh, a week from this coming money for Yah Santi Wa Blake, Dr. Blake, one of our ASCAC stalwarts, international secretary, just a beautiful sister, very powerful presence. You know, she got up, went to church last Sunday and, you know, didn't make it to the afternoon all of a sudden. So tomorrow's not promised. So I ain't trying to pump it up with caffeine and continue that. God knows how many more breaths I have because we all got to go that way. But ain't no need to exacerbate it if you can. So I'm sitting there drinking my decaf. I'm getting ready. I'm going up to get the coffee. And there I see a couple of like crumpled up dollar bills on the counter. 
And about two paces to the right of those dollar bills on the counter, there's a black man. And he got a baseball shirt on T with Hopkins on it. But one side is exposed, almost like he wearing it like flash dance, except it's just over his neck. He don't, he's, his hand is not through the sleeve. And he's making coffee. So he's putting his coffee, he's pouring his coffee. I said, bruh, this your money? He said, yeah, man, it's my money. He said, uh, I sure would. Uh, I sure wish I had another dollar to go with them too. So I went in my back pocket. <laughs> I joked with Dr. Rabot. That's, that's, how, that's, that's how I knew you was a good brother, man, because we went to get some lunch one day. And I said, you said, I'll pay. I said, no, I'll pay. And we both at the same time went with our right hands back in our pocket. Why? Because, you know, we was trained by old black men. Keep a couple of dollars in, you know, for black women, it's different places. Maybe it's the bra strap. Maybe it's the pocketbook. Maybe it's the front. But you don't put all your money in one place. So you might keep four or five singles in your back pocket. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's why I knew you was a black. I knew you all right because you got a little money in your back pocket. So I pulled you. I went in there and I gave him a dollar. He said, thank you, man. You know, I'm just trying to stay motivated. I said, me too, brother. He said, but we can motivate each other. I said, absolutely. So I gave him a fist bump. I made my coffee. I sat down. So I'm, I, I, I got my papers. I got my books. You know, I'm reading. I'm starting to read. And he comes by with his coffee. And we started talking. And I had on a Tennessee State hoodie yesterday. And he says to me, he says, uh, oh, you from Tennessee? I said, yeah. He said, you went to Tennessee State? I said, yeah, I went to Tennessee State. I said, where you from? He said, I'm from Raleigh, Durham. I said, oh, North Carolina Central. He said, my daughter's mother went to North Carolina Central. I said, oh, man, that's all, that's all right. He said, I went to St. Augustine's. You know that school? I said, St. Aug, I've been there. Absolutely. Right up the street. He said, yeah. I said, St. Aug, Shaw, and North Carolina Central all in that Raleigh Durham. No question. I said, the Falcons. He said, yeah, man. He said, you know, Charles Drew came through there. So we talking about, he's all excited. We're talking. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And the brother, he's got his call. He's standing. I'm sitting there. And then here come this white boy, cop. And he say hello and say good morning. Nothing. We standing there. It's about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. He says, uh, excuse me, sir. Could you please leave? Talking to the brother with the Hopkins baseball shirt on with his arm exposed with the hot coffee in his hand. I looked at the cop. I looked at the brother. I looked back at the cop. I said, excuse me, sir. I gave him some money for coffee, and uh, we're just having a conversation here. The cop looks at me. Young boy, he looked like he was maybe about five or six years old. He he looked at me. He says, uh, well, sir, he took that cup out the trash. No place to run. No place to hide. Now I got to make a call at this moment. Do I have to shout at this cop or do I maintain my cool because this brother right here has no place to run, no place to hide. Everybody lives someplace, but he can't live standing in the Panera with a hot cup of coffee in his hand. Three dollars to his name that I know of. Being a human being in a governance conversation with another African about schools. Because in a social structure, this is a homeless man and a threat to whatever punk at that Panera at the corner of Georgia Avenue and 29 in the Silver Spring area of Washington, D.C. Because I asked the white boy, I said, and y'all don't forgive me for using the term white boy. I asked the white boy, I said, did you, did they call you to come here and tell him to leave? He said, yes, sir. Hmm. At that moment, the brother said, it's okay. It's okay. I'm leaving. He said, thank you, brother. I said, oh, thank you, man. He said, then he looked at the cop. He said, staying in my business. And he walked out the door. There are moments I hate the society we live in. I don't know what that man was facing yesterday, what he faced after he left. I don't know what he's been facing for a long time. I know his, yeah, I know he has a daughter. I know his daughter's mother went to North Carolina Central. I know he went to St. Augustine, one of our great schools. I know he is from Raleigh Durham. Let me tell you what the social structure knows. He's a threat. Now, that man came back up in that Panera with a bomb, <laughs> killed that cop, me. 
the manager that called it, the police on it. The new all the newspaper would know is crazy man, unless he was white, at which point he would be mentally disturbed and they would look in his background and figure out whether it was Maine or the Cup Foods in Buffalo or wherever, or Vegas or wherever some white man said so they would immediately begin to look to see to humanize him. But this man wouldn't know nothing about the rest of that stuff. Now, maybe, you know, Karen Hunter. Maybe narrative in Nubia, maybe Roland Martin, maybe Mike Harriet, maybe the Griots would, would investigate and find this other stuff out. But that would be drowned out by the Joes and the Mikas and them and by the white NASA saying that that still don't mean you could take anybody's gun, including people that beat the hell out of women and shoot at people, which was the case before the Supreme Court this week. It still wouldn't change them. In other words, this whole thing would go on. But at the end of the day, this man had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. This man is a human being, clearly husbanding his resource. All he wanted was a cup of coffee. I'm going to tell you who had a cup of coffee this morning. B.B. Netanyahu had a cup of coffee this morning. While somebody woke up to the news that their child is dead. Because that punk is the head of a government dropping bombs on people. And everybody not in Hamas, unless apparently you take a picture, at which point you're a terrorist. And so, you know, many Palestinians didn't wake up this morning because the bombs my tax money paid for. So the framing question for us today is drawn really from framing question five of our African studies course. We took it the first time. We're about to offer it again in Nubia. So I would encourage you all, you know, and, you know, we do stuff in Nubia. It's a beautiful thing. Every day there's something in Nubia, something live, something recorded, interactions, all the rooms that we're in, organizing, building. And I'll make a note here that, um, you know, the Western region of ASCAC is meeting on December the 1st. But I looked at it and I thought, well, you know, we'll just have to toggle back and forth because December the 1st uh, in Nubia, we want to, it's the anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott, the launch of the bus boycott in 1955. And I saw that there's a new docu, uh, there's a new film on uh, Netflix on Bayard Rustin and Coleman Domingo is in it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's Chris Rock <laughs> uh, is in it. And so, you know, I'm like, huh. but my favorite in terms of fictional recounting of the uh, of Bayard Rustin, the character, you know, Eric Dellums, who, you know, Nubians reminded everyone, the son of Ron Dellums, Congressman Dellums, plays Bayard Rustin in the Clark Johnson vehicle boycott and brother lord thank you for coming in laura crocodile uh you know you were here now we talked monday night about that film and the book that it's based on the thunder of angels which is an oral history of the montgomery bus boycott to me it's still the best film if you want to just have a nice rendering that just moving and kind of gives you a movement and memory feel based on being historically accurate, you know, E.D. Nixon and, of course, Rosa Parks and sister who played Rosa Parks, which is beautiful. And, of course, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King played by the great Jeffrey Wright and Carmody Dojo. Now, Jeffrey Wright is in this new film as well, and I guess I'll watch it. But even looking at the trailer, you know, the music was a little loud. The, the acting was, you know, good acting, but it's kind of broad. I like that kind of subtle Kind of thing. Eric Dellums played the hell out of um out of Bayard Rustin in boycotts. So I think we're gonna watch that. Uh, in fact, I know we are on the first of December in, in Nubia, but more on that in a minute. But again, thinking about this framing question for the course that we'll then we'll, we'll, we'll launch again shortly in Nubia. Uh framing question five, of course, is how did Africans make sense of and participate in international developments? So for us as African people in this global Africa, I'm not thinking about Africa in the diaspora right now. I'm thinking about global Africana, place, past, present, future, often converging. You know, what happens when you have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide? Not even for a moment's respite, not even for a cup of coffee on a Friday morning when you got to figure out how to get from here to here to here in the next hour. Well, you can't find protection with distance. You, we're not in Israel. We're not in West Bank and Gaza here in the United States or in London where Brother Oz is and Adesoje. We are not in uh, uh, Israel or Palestine if we are in the Caribbean or Latin America where Jack's ancestors are and in, in, in family in Jamaica or Aya's family is in Nigeria. We're not, we're not in those areas right now, but you can't find protection in the national legislature in the United States. And it's not alone. There was a there was an article yesterday in uh, yesterday's Financial Times, the front page of the Times. Mm, I put the paper up once I was dealing with BB and them. Um, oh yeah, here it is. This on the front page of yesterday's FT, which I was reading as uh, before. It was so rudely interrupted by the baby cop. 
that the black manager could near call. Good for calling the police on people. I understand you got to manage it. Somebody told you to do it. That's the protocol. And I'm looking at all these people sitting in here with no food in front of them. Not even a cup of coffee because rain outside. But y'all drew a beat on this man. Sanchez poised to retain power, poised to retain power after amnesty deal with Catalan separatists. Spain's ruling Socialist Party has sealed a contentious amnesty deal with Catalan separatists to pave the way for a caretaker prime minister, Pedro Sanchez, to secure another term in office. So, you know, Sanchez is kind of left leaning prime minister of Spain, but he can't put a government together because he got them neo-Nazis in Spain like they are in the rest of Europe. And these and these right wingers, these white nationalists who want to take over the legislature, he won more votes, but he didn't have enough votes for a coalition. So in order to make a deal, he made a deal with those those Catalan folk who want to be a separate country in Spain. And the deal involved, at least according to the reports, they believe it involved um, releasing some of the leaders of the Catalonia mo movement who have been incarcerated. You got to make a deal. Because if you don't, the prospect of a pact I'm reading now has triggered several nights of protest outside Socialist Party headquarters in Madrid, where supporters of the opposition popular, popular party, PP, and the hard right Vox group have mixed with neo-Nazis blamed for violent clashes with police. Now I'm raising that to say that you can ban children at Columbia, young people, who say they want peace, but... You're living in a world where straight neo-Nazis, straight white nationalists in Spain and the United States can just say whatever the hell they want. They can put targets on people's back like that fool in Arizona did to uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You can talk about killing people, wiping people out because you've created a climate where once you have put people in a place and dehumanize them, you can do whatever the hell you want to do with them. I took a picture. You're a terrorist, and we're going to put you on the list, and so we're going to eliminate you. And we sitting back like, hmm, I ain't got no, I ain't got no dog in there. Ask Rashida to leave. A censure vote. Now, we know the white nasses are going to vote to censure her, but guess what? I'm not going to move very quickly to, it was the 2022 Democrats. No, no, no. It was 22 Democrats, and, and, and Congresswoman Wilson, with all due respect, Maybe you got some explaining to do this. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't think you have to. And you can say that too. But I don't want to move too quickly from those white nationalists that provided the majority of the votes, the overwhelming majority of the votes. Why? Because they're white nationalists. Are they human beings? Well, that would be up to them. Because what we're going to stop doing is allowing them places to hide. Allowing them places to hide. You get to hide behind being a white nationalist. Once you're white nationalist, we have no expectations of you. No, here's our expectation. Get rid of all of them. The parties are the same. <laughs> if the parties are the same, then why wouldn't you get rid of all of them? That's what I'm trying to do. No, what you're trying to do is put one of them in power. Don't be stupid. Put your best opponent. Is that can we all agree we need our best opponent our, that gives us the best chance of victory? And victory doesn't come in one fell swoop. It comes incrementally. It comes like a ballot resolution preserving a woman's right to make decisions about her body in the state of Ohio. And then the white NASA's in the legislature as David Pepper, who uh what's here is his book. I thought I had his book around. I keep it kind of close. Laboratories of autocracy. Ah, I thought I had it around here. Anyway, yeah, there it is. Laboratories of Autocracy, David Pepper, who is an Ohio former ex-legislator and lawyer in Ohio, wrote this book. That's We know that's what they're going to do. The people say put it in the Constitution. So here come the white nationalists that are gerrymandered into their districts, the home of uh, uh, Jim Jordan, Gymnasium Jordan, and they've, they've legislated themselves in a way so that they can now They've used the laws to, to protect themselves in the districts by packing them with white nationalists. So they're going to try to take the court's ability to interpret the Constitution from the court. Well, guess what? Go ahead, go ahead, baby. Because what you're going to do is you're going to strip yourself of anywhere to run and hide. And at that point, we say, OK, well, since you don't want to do it that way, we'll do it the other way. But the point is this. We know those are incremental victories. You're inching toward the bigger victories, but you don't do it by trying to blow up the system from the beginning. And I'm not saying work inside the system. I'm saying outside, inside, upside, downside, all sides. Use all the tools. And so you can't find protection in the national legislature, certainly if you receive 22 Democrats join the rest of the white nationalists and since you receive it to leave, standing there, voice shaking in tears. This sister said, I grew up in a black city, Detroit. 
and the mummy sitting up in the White House can't say nothing. Why? Hostage to his own fears. And people who are not thinking that you got to think about all of it strategically, saying, I'm not voting for Joe Biden. He killing people. Oh, yeah, and Donald Trump ain't going to kill nobody. He's a paragon of decency. Yeah, it will be no Palestinians dying to his watch. Boy, don't be stupid. But the point is this, to leave hung out to dry. Mike Johnson in that same federal legislature with a government shutdown looming, got his little blow dried uh, super cuts haircut now. Still looking like about one generation removed from white sheets. Not even one generation removed. <laughs> but, and he says, you want to know what I think? Read the Bible. Okay, I did read the Bible. Several times. Yes, children, they make you read it like every week. Yeah, go through Bible verse. go vacation, Bible school. We read the Bible. Do you really want to have a conversation about the Bible, bro? First of all, you're not in this Bible. Your people came from Europe. That's number one. No! Bring your ass back over here and put your eye on the words. We're gonna, we're gonna, you want us to read the Bible, right? We're going to read the Bible. Let's read the Bible. You couldn't even spell Christ when this story, them stories was co-mingled. So you want to dance with this? Let's dance, baby. You want to read the Bible? But we know this ain't got to do with the Bible. This got to do with power and place. And everybody got to live someplace. Right now, you think you're going to rule over us. You're going to hang this sister out to dry because she says, I'm standing with our common humanity. You know what you're doing? You're stripping your safe, yourself of a place to run and hide. Because decent people are looking like, I can make a choice now. You can't find protection from domestic violence. You can't find protection for domestic violence, whether it's the Supreme Court case this week that was argued about this domestic abuser in Texas who's shooting at people, too. And you want to let him keep his gun, Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito. But last year in the New York uh, versus Brewer case, you saying you can't take guns from nobody. And Ketanji Brown Jackson is in orals this week saying, I told y'all. This is where it's going to go. And John Roberts ain't got nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. You done caught the car now, Joker. And you don't know what to do with it. So now what you got to figure out is how to make the narrowest ruling to, to, to the reign in that rogue ass Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that's willing to overturn everything because that's the mission they were sent on by the cynical GOP elected officials who were put in office by the white nationalists who voted for them. But the parties are the same. Don't get me started. Now, you can't find protection in your own bed, Breonna Taylor. We couldn't stop you from being killed. But, you know, if you want to talk about Black America's Attorney General, and I don't even talk in those terms, but if I must pick Black America's Attorney General, it's going to be Kristen Clark, who's in the Department of Justice because an administration was put in and put her in a place, and she, she handed out consent degrees like Oprah gives white women cars. You get a consent degree. You get a consent. Degree. You get a pattern and practice investigation. You get a pattern and practice investigation. You get a pattern and practice. Yeah, because remember when the other board was in, they tried to get out of the one in Baltimore. It's the first thing they did coming in. Jeff, old times there, not forgotten sessions. You remember when he was attorney general? I know it was a long time ago. What about 75 years, 150 years ago? Whatever. The Trump administration. Get out the new shoe. Kristen coming in there like, who else are we going to investigate? I'm going to get all up under all. You'll give me all your records. I want your draws. I want your mama's draws. I want all the straw at the back of that hay barn over there. I want the pillowcase stuff. In, I want it all. And we're going to lay it all out. And then I'm going to come back to the table like, this is what you're going to do. But I know it don't make no difference until you get stopped in the middle of the night. And then you want to talk about, I need a lawyer. <laughs> Who the judges matters, but I ain't get too deep into it because I know this ain't gonna really penetrate the uh, cosplay uh, revolutionaries, and that's fine. That's fine. I had no problem with that because I know that there are more of us who understand who don't have a commitment to an ideology before we have a commitment to our common humanity who do understand, and that's just a matter of what Luria is doing and what L Joy is doing and what Cliff and Latasha are doing. You, you got under Daniel Cameron's stint, skin with that under uh, uh, that Uncle Daniel uh, ad. That's a beautiful thing. Because your mama know better. Watching you sworn in as Attorney General of Kentucky with your mama standing there holding the Bible with that great pride on her face, the same look every black mother has. And I'm looking like, sis, you don't deserve this. And I know you're going to cape for your son no matter what he does, because that's what we do. But I also know that behind closed doors, I suspect there are different kind of conversations going on. But 
Young Dan Cameron ain't got to worry about that no more because you can't find protection in your own bed if you black in America. And Breonna Taylor did not find protection for sleeping in her own bed. But we made sure that that punk can't do it to nobody else. And you still ain't out the woods because the feds are on them cops. Now, you think Kristen Clark in there and the Department of Justice don't make a difference? You crazy. You can't find protection from white nationalism. Now the white boys are trying to, they've been doing this for years. They're getting a little bit closer to these state constitutional conventions because they want to change the federal constitution. Go ahead, baby, have a constitutional convention. Break it. It's going to be pain for us. But once you have demonstrated that we don't have any choice, more of us may get involved. I don't like thinking that way. It's going to be a lot of pain. But ultimately, we have to figure out a way to get involved, to get engaged, to pay attention, to make connections, to build with people who are making connections, and then intervene in ways that help those who are in the greatest harm's way, those who have the least protection, those who absolutely have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. So you can't find protection from the law internationally. This Wednesday, three Palestinian human rights lawyers, including the sister who wrote, oh, I'm going to her book around here. Um, she wrote the book on uh, international law in Palestine. Uh, she's a Palestinian. She's an international lawyer. They, she filed, they filed a lawsuit with the International Criminal Court to uh, investigate Israel for crimes of genocide and apartheid. They also call it for arrest warrants for Netanyahu, the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, and the defense minister, Yoav Gallant. You not go co-mingle Jewish and Israeli or Israeli and Zionist. What you not going to do is conflate Palestinian with Arab and Muslim. I know y'all tried it in the legislature of the United States of America at the House of Representatives when you censored Rashida Tlaib for being an Arab and a Palestinian and a Muslim. Shout out to Andre Carson. Shout out to uh, Ilhan Omar, Muslims who stood with her. The fact that they had to stand with her as Muslims should tell you how funky and messed up this country is. And where were the white Congress people on the steps? All I saw was non-whites, not people of color, non-whites. Because we say people of color, that means you, you mean, you, you, it means you define people as white. You know, you got all these people, then you have people of color. No, you got white people and non-white people. All I saw was non-white people. And I'm just using that as a stopgap definition. But what we're going to do, we're going to rob whiteness of any place to run and any place to hide. It wasn't even all the black people. I understand why Hakeem couldn't be out there. After all, we understand, don't we, brother? We, we understand, brother. But guess what? What arrest these people? What a board? Anyway, I'm not gonna, not gonna do that. But you know, the UN has passed conventions saying the racism, genocide. You know that, that that Zionist is racism. All these over the years. Um, but understand that there are other interests in place that protect people who are killing from the sanction of international bodies that the people who are killing set up in 1945 to manage the world after World War I and World War II that they had built on our backs in the previous three, four centuries. That's what the United Nations is. But you don't want to go by the UN rules. Why? Because everybody get a seat at the UN and when they start voting against you, if you can't block it, you ignore it. But I understand why, in fact, I've been reading this. Uh, this is Eshel Rudy's book. Uh, Eshel Rudy was the Minister of Information in Apartheid South Africa. He's written, he wrote a lot of stuff. He passed away back in i think 1990 or something like that this is called the real information scandal this is one of his bigger books right and rudy has a chapter in here chapter three israel and africa and he's talking about these arguments that these apartheid cabinet members the prime minister all these people minister of defense had about what should be the relationship of south africa apartheid south africa to israel and to the rest of africa because they trying to control south africa in the 1970s and 80s as people in South Africa are increasingly fighting back. Remember, they tried to do Bantu stands. Yeah, should be familiar to those people who know the history of South Africa and who know the history now that's going on, what's going on in historic Palestine and Israel. The point is this. He says that they're having an argument about how to treat Israel. 
He says, Brian Forey, Secretary for Foreign Affairs, and his minister, Dr. Hilgert Mueller, Mueller, became so obsessed with the idea of winning the favor of black states in Africa, while at the same time not antagonizing the Arabs, that in his way of thinking, an active and high-profile alliance with Israel was completely precluded. We, on the other hand, meaning him and his people, the minister of propaganda, who bought Western press to hide South Africa's crimes. If you understand what's being written today about what's going on in Israel, West Bank, Gaza, in the United States press, go back to the 70s and the 60s and the 80s and how they were writing about South Africa. Don't get cute. And when you read Rudy, he said, we paid them millions to sculpt the stories a certain way. If, and if y'all don't like it in the Eurostream press, I'm a subscriber to the Financial Times and New York Times. So, Guess what? Whatever. Anyway, he goes on and says, we argued at a time that at a time when the West, free world, he's got parentheses, was lacking in strong and determined leadership, Israel and South Africa formed the two pillars supporting the free world's strategic interest in Africa and the Middle East. He did not say racial. He did not say cultural. He did not say ancient hatreds that go back a hundred million years when the sun was born and they've been fighting since they were in the middle of the sun fighting. It's been a billion years. And <laughs> strategic interests. Diamonds, gold, natural gas, oil. Come on now. Let's don't get mad. Get smart. We ain't got nothing to do with that. Is there coal tan in the Congo? You think this is about the Tutsis and Hutus in Eastern Congo? Do you really think this is about ancient hatreds in Congo? No, it's about what's empowering these devices that we're having this conversation on. So he goes on and says, we argued further that Israel was surrounded by 100 million hostile Arabs and that South Africa was confronted by more than twice that number in blacks, most of them politically hostile to South Africa and the West. Should one of Israel or, should one of Israel or South Africa succumb, the chances were great that the black and Arab states would gang up against the remaining one with disastrous results, either in the strategic Middle East or the mineral rich southern part of Africa. The free world would, finally, to our way of thinking, not survive a global Marxist onslaught if its two strategic pillars in Africa and the Middle East collapsed. Now, he put Marxism in because that's the boogeyman they put in. You're communist. Spell it. Spell it, Marjorie. Quick, 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 quick. Don't. That's what I thought. That's why you had to say CRT, because you can't spell critical race theory. Them three words, and they all got letters in them. So it's a problem. CRT, just take the CRT. But they put communists as a, as a boogeyman. But the real thing is, if South Africa, apartheid South Africa, and apartheid Israel, if one of them collapsed, the other one going to get the full onslaught. So they were partners. Partnership. This is the same Rudy. It's Shell Rudy who transported devices used to detonate atomic bombs from Israel to South Africa in the 70s. And this is the same Rudy when they caught him embezzling money and put him on trial in South Africa. It's one of the reasons he wrote these books. Mad at his white co-collaborators. He went into exile, but he had a place to run and hide. Where? Atlanta. Michelle Rudy died at age 60 on the tennis court playing tennis in Atlanta where he had been exiled for like 10, 12 years because this white nationalist government in the United States, the gladiator invader of Grenada, y'all know he all friend, his name on the airport in Northern Virginia, gave him a place to run and hide. These folk go just like that president of Brazil came up here. The Trump of the tropics, as they call him. My point is this, finally, as I'm kind of winding to a close, you can't find protection from a system, even as you are working within the system and without the system to change it, you're not looking, you don't have nowhere to run, nowhere to watch. If there's no you, then there's no right to self-defense. This is, this is the point that we're talking about now. If there's no you, the idea that there are no Palestinians, that there's no sovereign territory there, that there's a, so when people say we're going to censure these kids at Columbia, we're going to censure uh, Rashida Tlaib, we're going to censure Mark, uh, hill for saying from the river to the sea let's do that right now the river jordan river the sea mediterranean sea you know who's in control from the river to the sea right now israel and what did ehud barak say it either israel is going to be a democracy which means it won't be jewish or it's going to be an apartheid state you can't be both but guess what what's so bad about letting everybody vote wait you're commingling Jewish and is and Israel. 
Well, yes, the Jewish state. No, that would be an ethno state. And guess what? It's millions of Jews in Israel and millions of Palestinians in Israel. And there are millions of people who are who, who adhere to the Jewish ways of knowing in Israel to say, we should let everybody vote. What you scared of? And guess what? It's some Jews and it's some Muslims who will never get along with each other. But guess what? You ain't got to go around the world for that. You can stay right here in the United States of America for that. And guess what? The ones who hate everybody now running the lower chamber of the federal legislature, now running the state legislature of Ohio, thought they was going to continue to run a Boston in Virginia until Tuesday, continue to run the legislature in Mississippi because three or five or five 1,500 more Negroes decided that they would rather not participate and let the bad toupee Dollar General store clothes and toupee wearing Tate Reeves go back as, as governor of Mississippi rather than Elvis Presley's cousin. You can't elect Elvis Presley's cousin in Mississippi. That means somebody stayed home in a state that's 40 plus percent black. I'm not blaming black people. That's not blaming black. I'm not blaming black people because I'm not like Heather Koch Richardson and them talking about the greatness of America and what went wrong and how we can fix it. I'm saying, how are you going to vote in a way? How are you going to participate in a way? How are you going to organize in a way that moves, as Karen Hunter say, from protest to power? And how are you going to figure out how to do it in a place where if there's no you, there's no right to self-defense? By if no you, I'm saying there's no place where we recognize your particular type of humanity when it comes to defending our common humanity. Whether it be Roger Taney in 1857 saying of Dredd and Harriet Scott and their two daughters, black people have no rights that anybody in this country white is bound to respect. Meaning when we give you some rights, fine. If we don't give you some rights, fine. Because you're not human. There's no you to respect. Or whether it be in what is now Israel and from the river to the sea saying these people here are not human like we human. So we're going to pretend like they ain't even here when we're making policy decisions. And so that is, means, you know, you don't have a place to run and hide when you have no place where that recognize there is a you. And that's why you can have domestic laws which normalize killing. Preemptive strikes against picture takers. In this book, Rise and Kill First, the idea that we're going to kill you before you can do something to us. Hospital bombings. Seeding language in the media to say Hamas instead of Palestinian. There's no you. So therefore, there's no right to self-defense. And you can say a third, some third things like we killed 100,000 people to get at two. Did you find the two? The fact that you even asked that question means you've accepted that as a nominal premise that you're going to treat this like some kind of sporting event where you're tallying the cost. Europe's xenophobia is the cradle of this mess in North Africa. There's an interesting book I just started reading called Last, The Last Ships from Hamburg. Business rivalry and the race to save Russia's Jews on the eve of World War I. This is uh, Stephen Ujifusa's book. Stephen Ujifusa is, is very interesting. Um, he uh, He's an author. He's got all these background degrees. I mean, anyway, but the point I want to raise is this. Between 1890 and 1921, two and a half million Jews were fleeing Eastern Europe. And they came to the United States. Many came on steamships that came out of Hamburg. Who owned those ships? Well, I'll just read you from the flyleaf. The mass exodus was facilitated by three businessmen whose involvement in the Jewish American narrative has largely been forgotten. Jacob Schiff, the managing partner of the investment bank Kuhn, Loeb and Company, who used his immense wealth to help Jews leave Europe. Albert Ballin, the manager director of the Hamburg American line who created a network of trains and steamships to transport them across continents and an ocean and JP Morgan. Hey, Jamie diamond, hundred million dollars. You got some money. Hey, let me get a couple of ticks. JP Morgan. That's your JP Morgan, right? JP Morgan, the mastermind of the international mercantile Marine trust who tried to monopolize the lucrative steamship business. You know, I'm reading this book. What's going on in North Africa you got nothing to do with the North Africans. As we talked about a few weeks ago, Europe created this mess and it started because you stripped from human beings any place to run, any place to hide. You stripped them out of Germany. You stripped them out of Russia. They getting on ships trying to go. And meanwhile, J.P. Morgan trying to make some money. Of You know, J.P. Morgan had interest in the Titanic. And what Uchivusa writes about is that when the Titanic sank in 1912, Jews died on the Titanic. Two class of Jews. 
the rich, those who had money who were in first class and those who were in steerage. The ones in first class, many of them from Germany. The ones in steerage with no money, just got enough money to get on the boat, J.P. Morgan's boat, they were from Russia. And so to solve this, of course, Great Britain says, we're going to give you a place to run and hide. What? We're going to carve out Palestine since we didn't push them people out. And then those people said, oh, damn, you're looking for a place to run and hide? Come on down here with us. Next thing you know, you done took their house. But guess what? That conflict that was seeded in Europe that has been let onto the, the rest of the world, everybody finally is being removed. You know what's being removed? Any place to run and hide from this confrontation. And this is an opportunity for us an opportunity for us to confront the fact that when you strip people of their places to run and hide, all that's left is you. All the lights are on and you got to make a choice. Our common humanity or you going to try? You can't go back there. We didn't strip you of all them places to run and hide. You got to leave that behind. And we better do something very quickly, because if we don't, this whole thing is going to go up in conflagration of flames. And, and we got to confront our common humanity together. Mm. Thank you. Um, I also want to just add the how we get our knowledge about this and then how we talk about it is extremely important. Um, you know, the, the space on YouTube, a lot of people do their own research, uh, but is the source a clean glass of water? Are you reading the books? Yeah. And again, I, I want to thank you for reading the books so we don't have to necessarily, you know, um, because the way you break them down is really helpful and at least gives me and I hope others, uh, the rabbit holes, the threads to pull, you know, because we cannot begin to have this conversation without a, a common base of knowledge, without facts being facts. And, you know, all the facts have to be the same. You know, we have to all have the same set of facts Yes, to have an honest conversation or even an assessment of what this is. You know, the, the clip that I'm going to leave us with, mm. it was Charles Ogletree, brilliant attorney who made transition this year. Yes. Um, yes questioning challenging generals and journalists and asking the questions the only way you know people like you with the law background the questions that make us search our souls right as tamika yes. mallory was talking about getting death threats for having the audacity to say uh, a person that would allow a woman to be shot in her home should not be president and not not even convene a, a grand jury which we know they say a grand jury can indict a ham sandwich that is not hyperbole is absolutely true you Anybody who is in that position can indict anybody, right? Because it's easy to do that and let, let the law play it out. And he wouldn't even do that to give mm. justice to Brianna. So, you know, for her to come down there four months and start an organization around making sure he didn't get elected and to get death threats as a result of that, to me, is really weird. Um, I had a woman on last week who was organizing, she's a pastor, organizing uh, people in Florida around the book base. Yes, yes. Getting yes. death threats. Getting death threats. Yes. And, and I'm like, you know, so you want to kill people, journalists, for taking pictures. Like, so what are you afraid of? What are is, you afraid of? Is the truth that scary for people to learn? And I, I think about um, as I'm watching both Bass Reeves and Surrounded and all these things, you know, about Buffalo Soldiers. As I'm watching and going back, Black folk couldn't read under threat of death. And, you know, you think about Black folk not being able to learn how to read. Mm. Under and if you mm. taught a black person how to read, threat of death. Like it's always a threat of death to get knowledge, right? It's always a threat of death to to fight for power. There's always a threat of death. But if we center humanity around all of these issues and and start to search our souls about the importance of everyone knowing, like everyone should know. Should we be? That's right. And you can change and you can change your mind. You can change your course. Because I mean, without you know, as you say, with Bass Ruiz and with many of the Buffalo soldiers, you're fighting your way out of enslavement. It's a Hobson's choice. It's not a good choice. But when they send you to Mexico to chase Pancho Villa later on, and we got, you know, that's why Gerald Horn wrote his book, Black and Brown. And he wrote the counter-revolution of 1836. Many of those soldiers realized, you know what? I don't have to fight these people that look like me. They never did anything to me. Many of them stayed in Mexico to this day. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so like you said, the more you know, you switch it up. Nobody is saying that Buffalo soldiers were sellouts. You're trying to fight your way out of it. What would you have done? I mean, like you said, but the more you know, the day you make a different choice. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just something. So I, I thank you. Uh, you've made me a better journalist. 
uh, definitely a, a better person uh, talking about things because I, I now have a base of knowledge that I didn't have before. And I want to know more. I want to know more. The thirst is there. And I thank you. Uh, thank, uh, you. That. thank you. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to close the tree. I must ask you this, though, because we, we got heavy today. We've been getting heavy because these past past month and a half, yeah, you know, you know and, and I know that, you know, for those people who have a couple of hours to just sit, not to get away, but to kind of restore and then continue to work. You know, I will say that yesterday after that man thing had me so shook. I was so mad. I just I walked in the theater and went to watch Ms. Marvel, the Marvels, because <laughs> I went to see the Marvel. Because I'm a Tiana Paris fan. I love the young Packy sister that's playing Ms. Marvel. You know, and the thing about Marvel, it's a comic book movie. So I know this. They just try to get the money. And guess what? The world market. The thing I'll say this very quickly. The MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Disney's money machine understands that the world is overwhelmingly non-white. If you think it's a mistake that they got the Pakistanis, they got the Muslims, they got the, no, they got the black, they got the Chinese and Shang-Chi, Disney getting all the money. And guess what? White fanboys in the comic book stores mad. Oh, the movie. About, let me tell you, if you want to go spend a couple of dollars and go, go see the Marvels. I'll tell you what I you am, want to do. You know, you ain't gonna see you gonna see a you gonna see a panoply, a color panoply, intergalactic panoply that looks like you, and that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I actually, actually uh, rewatched Ms. Marvel last night, and, and, yes, and man. I just wanted to remind myself, you know, <laughs> of, of this, you know, because because we can do all things, right? And yes, you know, for some folk, and and I remember, and I hope we get to do this. When I asked you how you got into reading. It was comic yes. books. Comic your father books. thought your father thought these were little funny books that you were wasting your time. <laughs> and so I just need us to, you know, broaden, broaden. You know, we can we can have fun, we can have joy, we can read funny little books that can inspire a That's great true. car to become the scholar that he is. It's all it's all good. It's yeah, all good. It is, and uh, it is, it I'm is. thankful, thankful to be here. I love you. I love, I love you immensely. Love I'm gonna you. leave you with this. Um, this. And shout, shout, out, shout out to uh, shout out to our sister Sherilyn Eiffel too, who's yes. one of these. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I love it. Okay. That if you and that if you're in, you're in. I mean, I live in fear, of course, of coming upon an American movie, as well as a South Coastalese one. But if you made the decision, you would film the North Coastalese shooting the American soldier. Well, I guess I, I guess I would. I guess I no. I guess I wouldn't. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you now what I'm feeling, rather than, than than the hypothesis I drew for myself. If I was with the North Kozanese unit that came upon Americans, um, I think I personally would do what I could to warn the Americans, even if it means not getting the live coverage. Well, it would mean my life, and I don't have much doubt about that, I think. And, and I'm very glad this is a hypothetical. But, <laughs> um, but I, do not, I, I do not think I could bring myself to participate in that fashion. That's purely personal. Other reporters might have a different reaction. Mr. Wallace? I think some other reporters would have a different reaction. Such as? They would, they would regard it simply as another story that they are there to cover. They're going to cover enemy soldiers shooting and killing American soldiers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you imagine how they would report that to the American people? Surely I can. Could you do it? Would I do it? I'm an old man. I don't know that I would do it. I find it very difficult to believe, and I'm, 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 I'm astonished, really, to hear Peter say that. You're a reporter. Granted, you're an American, but you're a reporter covering combat between North Coast and South Coast and, and the Allies. And I'm a little bit at a loss to understand why, because you are an, are an American, you would not have covered that story. I mean, when we go back to Vietnam, there were all kinds of reporters who did indeed go in to Hanoi, wanted to go to Haiphong. Everybody wanted to go there. Why would a reporter say, I'm not going to cover that because I am unhappy about what's happening? It's not unhappiness, Mr. Wallace. It's don't you have a higher duty as an American citizen to do all that you can to save the lives of soldiers rather than this journalistic ethic of reporting the fact? 
No, you don't have the higher duty to... No, no. You're a reporter. Your job is to cover what is going on in that war. People know that Americans are getting killed in that war. Lord knows it's a hypothetical. I would probably, right? I'd get on, right? I'd get on the horn with Peter and say, "What the dickens do you mean?" Yeah, you I think he's right too. I chickened out. I mean, <clears throat> I played the hypothetical very hard, but I think he's right. I, I think they've got the same problems that Downs has. What's the problem, General Scope? Uh, I think the problem is the situation, the job, as opposed to a higher, to a higher cause. First of all, I think you're Americans first, and you're journalists second. Just as I think that Downs is. Sure, he's a unit commander, and he's got these terrible ethical problems. But we do live by rules in this society, rules of right and wrong, even situationally in the, up, in the, in the broad sense. <coughs> General we Scowcroft, can't get away what with in the world this. is wrong with photographing this attack by North Coast on There's, American soldiers? Simply because what's it worth? It's worth 30 seconds on the evening news as opposed to saving a platoon, what have you. I mean, what difference does wait, it wait, make wait. on the evening news? You see some, you see some Americans get killed. In other words, what and you're saying is that the reporter should say, "Hey, hold it, fellas! Americans, these guys are about to go after you, and and you die." That's okay. really what, what, what the question is here. Yeah. And your answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you see, and I agree with oh, you. Let's all right, I'm sorry. I want. I needed to jump back in. First of all, we're not having these conversations. No, isn't that something? Isn't that something? This is a this is public television. This is mass media of a different age, but it's not a hundred years ago. Many of those people still, well, most of them now gone, but recently gone. Tree just made transition. Yeah, isn't that something? How would you? Okay, so okay, so tell us, Prof. Teach us here for us. What do you see when you see something like that? What has changed between then and now? I was, I was going when I was planning for my class yesterday. It was clear to me that what it means to be American has changed and shifted. And maybe it always was kind of like when Muhammad Ali said, "I'm not going over there to fight these people." That they didn't do y'all. Y'all the one got me at the back of the bus and drinking from a colors only water fountain, lynching and all that. Those people aren't doing me harm. That's right. And and when he verbalized that, he was a pariah. He was a terrorist. He was somebody that got That's stripped right. of his titles and, and imprisoned, uh, threatened with imprisonment. That's right. And that wasn't so long ago either. But it's the same now. Like, as we watch the protests all over the country regarding the, the decimation of what's going on, of human life, um, which is not at the forefront of the conversation, yeah. journalists are being asked similar questions, but they're not wrestling with it the way I watched Mike Wallace came around full circle, came back to, I don't know. He was very definitive and then didn't know Peter Jennings was like, well, I thought I knew, but now I'm reversing. And <laughs> but even that wrestling should be what we all are doing when you're confronting what, what Charles Ogletree did, which was masterful as the journalist in this case with a law degree. Asking the or, or, or the prosecutor. The prosecutor, there you go. And, yeah, he, he, he was treating them like hostile witnesses. Yes, and it was beautiful because <laughs> yep. not a single black face, not a single other face, and we had generals in that room. That's right. Generals who whose job, who was sworn to fight for American values. But I think we're now at a place where we have to all question what are American values? What does it mean to be American? What, what do we stand for? And yeah. if you're not having that question, yeah, leveled at everybody that wants to serve and sw be sworn in what does that red white and blue mean to you today and how do we engage for me you know i'm always thinking about in order to make it a more perfect union it requires us to do that right um you know, this country's not not where it should be but to get where it's going to get is not about yelling in the void that's why a protest of power has to be the action item right so we have to force it to become the it's thing true. that it must be. It's and you, you, you keep talking about it breaking and crumbling. Yes. And even in the breaking and the crumbling, the falling of the leaves, the, the death that happens naturally every season, new stuff grows. That's right. But That's it requires what I had to remember. None of this is permanent. Right. The form of government's not permanent. So, I mean, how do you think, I'm thinking now, even in terms of, you know, using the Africana framework, if you think about the category of science and technology, 
you know, this this is filmed at a period when there is no Internet. There's no billion voices uploading and downloaded. There's an audience that is curated for sure but you got a, a a person of african descent who is well aware who he is moving in these elite social structures so to speak which is why they have him there but who is unafraid to use that venue one of what would you say maybe four if we talk about abc cbs nbc and pbs or what however that's in the wake of the immediate wake up and you mentioned ali and when we think about it vietnam so in other words for the people in that room they remember for some of them world war ii as far back korea vietnam is fresh you can still smell the smoke so these are how much is part of what we where we are now a function of the kind of atomization of media so they don't have those places so that there's not a money ball shot that somebody like a charles Ogletree could take today even if he was on cnn there are a billion other options right. and we've forgotten even the afghanistan invasion even the Iraq of it, there's no smoke in our nostrils from the last time skin was in the game for me. I don't know. I and mean, what do you think? I mean, and 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 skin was never in the game because we watch mm. it like we do video games. And and unless you serve today's Veterans Day, shout out to all of the folk uh, who yeah. are family members yeah. and people who have served yeah. and and died. Uh, have people who died, frontline uh -huh. folk. Absolutely. You know, unless you were there. You know, uh, with the Agent Orange and the burning fields and the, you know, all of the Halliburtons and all. Unless you were there, you know, for, for many of us, I mean, people came back from Vietnam, as my uncles did, uh, to being deemed problematic, right? They weren't welcomed home as heroes. So so now we're dealing with a generation of that, you know, where they fought for a nation that unwillingly, because they were drafted, only to come back. And many of them, right now, we don't treat our veterans with respect no. and dignity. No, you know, that man in Panera's might have been a veteran. Oh, no question about it. You know, I more minutes than what I heard about it. That's exactly he right. They got some snotty nose, uh, half a piece of a person with a badge and license to take somebody's life, dehumanizing him in real time. As, if, as if you got any of this man's struggles and trauma and pain and suffering under the hands, under the yoke of this flag, right? That that black man in Panera's yesterday. In that something could have served this country with distinction, no question. No question. And, and and can't you know the VA and all like we got some reckoning Ooh. here. We have some Ooh. things that we gotta we gotta fix, but we have to fix them. And everybody again lives somewhere. So start with where you live. Come start on now. You live, make sure you show up locally, but more importantly, make sure you show up in your neighborhood. Make sure that there's nobody that that is in, in lack, not on your watch. Not on your watch. You no, know, no kid out there uneducated or wayward doing stuff. Not on your watch, because collectively we have the power to do that. We do. So, that's that's a word. That's a, that's a word on Veterans Day. That's a word on Veterans Day for every generation. For everybody who went into the military because they didn't have a choice, either through the direct draft or the economic draft, just trying to improve their lives. For everybody who suffered like the brother we talked about last week 75 year old brother vietnam vet who said i wanted to be a mortician so i could get the image of scooping guts out out of my head for everybody who has suffered for those who as you say can't get decent health care who can't get their benefits who want to go to school but somebody messed up the gi bill money who can't get a mortgage to use the loan because you don't want to give them a mortgage in a, in a in a neighborhood or the price is overvalued or somehow you want to check their credit fifteen thousand times for everybody it's not easy so yeah thank you professor hunter for bringing it all right back there we can all do something can't we we can all do something we can all do something mm. ashay love you uh, Love you too. I'll see everyone. Uh, Dr. Carr, of course. Yes, uh, Monday, Monday, night. Monday night. Tomorrow. Uh, uh, yeah. Tomorrow's Dr. Amen. We have mental health. Uh, Dr. Narisa. We got yes. yoga on Sundays in Nubia. So we'll see folks there. Mm. As well. Yeah. Breathe in, breathe yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, I need that. All right. I love, mm. you. love you. Love you too. All right, everyone. See y'all.